So, where are we going first? That's right. Excellent. So, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Scott Steedman. I'm a Vice President of Policy for SEN. Uh, I'm also a civil engineer by background, and I've spent a, a career in, in the city and, and urban engineering environment. So, huge pleasure to be uh, chairing this session this afternoon. Uh, we've got a number of speakers, and we've got a short time. So I'm going to suggest that we just uh, uh, move straight into that group. The program is on the screen behind me. As you listen to the speakers and you think about the role of standards, the voluntary standards that uh, we were talking about in the last session, how can voluntary standards made through a consensus of stakeholders help to deliver higher performing cities, not just in Europe, but around the world? So as you think about that, and uh, as I returned from India a, a month ago, where they talk about 100 smart cities in India, uh, uh, they have 92 cities over half a million, none of which have uh, 24 hours water, electricity, or waste. Uh, the concept of smart cities means different things around the world. But the most important aspect for, for us is to realize that with the digitization of the economy, uh, the world is changing fast. Cities are no longer what engineers and architects decide they're going to be. They are what people want them to be. So the role of standards bring a consensus of stakeholders ranging from consumers and residents, uh, participants, providers, the city authorities themselves, the innovators, the community, and the governments that manage the whole process. The role of standards is to accelerate the progress of smart cities to accelerate their performance. And as you think about cities you know, you'll realize that cities are all different in their aspirations. Some want to be green, some want to be energy efficient, some want to be safe, some want full employment, some want to manage the digital world. So lots of different aspirations to reflect. And in our standards discussion debate this afternoon, I want to, to talk about that range of standardization that is needed, the idea of consensus of good practice to accelerate city performance. So we have a, an excellent uh, a range of people to talk to you today. Uh, two uh, uh, experts from, from the city of Riga itself, one on the energy aspect and one, of course, on the, the city itself. And then we have uh, Jean-Felix, uh, who is coordinating the work across Europe, Simon Hicks from Etsy, and Dan Palmer. And I'll introduce them in turn. But you're looking there at, at a range of perspectives of the smart city challenge. So first of all, let me invite Ineta Elita from the uh, Riga Municipal Agency to present to us about the experience of the city of Riga. Ineta, thank you very much. Dear colleagues, uh, dear guests, dear friends, and dear stakeholders. Uh, it is an honor for me to be here and to talk to you about the smart cities, because to talk about smart cities without cities would indeed be a mistake. And uh, let me first um, uh, set a little bit of uh, stage where we are in Europe, because Familiarity with city processes is not always uh, everywhere at the same level. First of all, there is something very important that has happened uh, since 2008, and this is unprecedented political voluntary commitment of mayors, of leaders of cities. To the date, it's 6,000 349 cities across Europe, also in neighboring countries and some other countries in the world that have signed to go along with European Union and European Commission to reach uh, the EU 20, 20, 20 goals. That means to reduce uh, uh, CO2 emissions by 20%, to increase energy efficiency at least by 20% and to introduce renewables by 20%. And this commitment uh, came to each city with a specific requirement to set a policy document, but also monitor 
at least on two years basis, report and get evaluation of those reports. And for municipalities, this is a first mechanism. Uh, if uh, anybody in the audience is familiar with UN system of rep reporting to UN conventions, that is kind of similar system. Only cities do not go in front of the panel, but uh, submit their reports online. So, that was a movement, and then, uh, of course, we all remember crisis and also very important movements and interests from industries, uh, from governments to boost economy, and the important initiative, which is called uh, Smart uh, Cities and Communities Innovation Partnership, has been launched by European Commission. And in this initiative, we now counter not, unfortunately, yet 200,000 uh, people as are engaged in the standardization process uh, all across the European Union, but only 4,000 partners, 31 countries, and we work in uh, six directions, business models, finance and procurement, citizen focus, integrated infrastructure and processes, policy and regulations, integrated planning, that is my working group, uh, sustainable districts, built environment, and sustainable urban mobility. And before I go further, what are the city's needs and expectations, I would also like to tell that through the Covenant of Mayors process, planning policies, a lot of actions came not only in one sector, not only in energy, but very many initiatives were cross-sectoral, uh, especially energy and ICT. And uh, Riga has been leading a large project uh, financed by Interreg 4C called Green IT Network Europe, where we identified 161 good practice in different sectors, how to save energy uh, with ICT. And the last initiative uh, where Riga was uh, uh, taking active part, uh, and which was supported by European Union, it is the project we implement together with 12 partners uh, that is strategies towards energy performance and urban planning. And if these 6,349 cities are very diverse from small cities to a large cities like all capitals of European Union, we can see that even the cities like Ghent, who took part, like Glasgow, Riga and Gothenburg, when thinking of energy, we put as a first issues to tackle the sustainable economic growth and added value for community. So um, it is clear in every city that even though the problems are different, the setting of stakeholders, the different setting of policy documents and decision making is different, there is a need and interest to become a smart community. And you, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, very uh, precisely referred to the concept that is not clear yet. And when we talk about European Commission um, uh, initiative, then it basically embraces three sectors, that is uh, energy, ICT, and uh, transport. So, but when we look at the communities and we worked with different stakeholders, we saw that there are several different sectors that should be tackled. And uh, also, uh, we heard that food uh, standards, but also food standards in relation to CO2 emissions are a subject of discussion in a number of cities, and not only of discussion, but also of relevant actions. So, what is very important for regulation and standardization. First of all, uh, no one in the cities would say you should start somewhere bottom up, uh, sort of bottom down. You, sh you shouldn't start in Brussels, you cannot start in uh, neither of capitals, you should start it bottom up. And triple or even quadruple helix, because in the processes in cities, we cannot only rely on traditional setting of municipalities, of the universities and of businesses. And it is very important when thinking of standardization and voluntary standards, that we empower those who are the closest to the bottom. Because if you cannot measure, you cannot understand, you cannot influence. And if we would like to have 
energy efficient buildings, passive buildings, we really need to think how we can integrate the right processes, the right data processes, the right analysis processes, the right data recipients processes that allow both citizens, the households, also municipality, but also small and medium enterprises who would develop different um, uh, opportunities uh, to, uh, to build on this available data. So, uh, we have discussed with, uh, with our uh, partner cities and also in, uh, with some city networks that standards are very important especially for common platforms, connectivity and interoperability of technical devices. And that has been already uh, said uh, at the introductory session today. But we also think that we should set standards that create clarity of terminology and empower local authorities and citizens. So, and therefore, again, uh, the emphasis from the city point of view that uh, would be that there is no one solution for all cities. They are different. And also, it is important that if we discuss standards for smart cities, we have to go for principles of governance and management and, and, and uh, how we will guide the development in the cities. And then last but not least, when creating standards and engaging uh, with local communities and governments and uh, standardization bodies. We should go for co-creation and not only at the normal routine process, it could be also done by ICT tools and it could be done in very innovative ways. But it is really very important and I should stress here once again that there is no one citizen, which in most cases would be if we would look at the profile, if you would imagine citizen, probably that would be uh, a successful, professional, male, uh, white, um, and uh, having a car or probably a uh, summer house and some other things, <laughs> statistically. <laughs> but we should embrace all the differences and diversities because when setting standards, it is very important to understand that Europe is aging and there is a last population that do need devices that can be operated with not that fast and not so small fingers anymore. There should be uh, devices that can talk to different um, uh, services and city bodies where we will go. And we certainly think that it is very important to uh, support societal changes. For that, we need more pilot projects. And when I was introducing this um, uh, innovation partnership for, for smart cities, with my deep regret, I see that there is no Eastern and Central Europe countries largely represented, not at the same uh, level as the old member states of European Union. We also see a lot of industries represented, not so many cities. We have to work on that. And of course, it is clear that we have to build on capacities on the cities and embrace the small and the medium cities, which are actually uh, the largest number of cities in Europe. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anita, for a stimulating uh, uh, opening to this session. You've covered the whole subject beautifully. And I'm now going to ask uh, Jean-Félix to respond and, and to explain what is happening uh, through the coordination group of Sen and Senlec in the world of standards. Jean. Uh, good afternoon. Well, the title of this session is Building Smart City. But what does it mean? What are we talking about? What is a green city? What is an eco city? What is a connected city? What is a resource efficient city? There's a lot of terms that are used all over Europe and the world to present the ongoing works and challenges we are facing. It's a very complex issue. It cannot be resumed by one word, smart city. What are we talking about? about and where should we go there's a lot of framework reference document that have been developed by green building council by lead
by some official institution rating system, BRIM, or German one, DGNB, or the Japanese one, CASB, or the French one, HQE, and a lot of others. ISO tried to clarify this when the TC268 was implemented, and they have developed a standard, which is ISO 37101, which now is in ballot up to beginning of July. They tried to clarify the background, the different existing initiatives, the stakeholders that are involved, and to develop a methodology to face that. And what about SEN, SENELEC, and ETSI? They created a coordination group and a report now on their work. I will just thank for giving me this opportunity to present it now. The coordination group was implemented in 2012, and uh, so two years later, ETSI joined it. So now it's three standard organization coordination group, which Secretariat is provided by AFNO, and which has members from the National Standardization Institution, but also partners from uh, other uh, organizations, including the uh, European Union Commission and the EFTA Secretariat. Why do we develop standards for smart city? So, underpinning common understanding, I already mentioned the problem of uh, proliferation of spellings. To coordinate an holistic and integrated approach and to enable integration of system in response to the market, which is the basis of the demand and for beneficial needs of cities and citizens, as well as the providers of this market. The international law uh, is uh, the based on the, well, the other international institutions have, are developing their own framework reference documents, ISO now, has created an advisory committee, strategic advisory committee that will advise uh, the board of ISO and uh, issue a report in beginning of July this year. IEC has just issued a report some uh, weeks ago and ITU will also issue a document from its focus group on smart sustainable city. So there is a lot of initiative, and now coming back to the specific Sen Senelec Etsy coordination group, uh, they prepared uh, a report that was issued end of 2014, that was submitted to a ballot and adopted, and if I resume the 23 recommendations that are including in this report that will be very soon on the website of the SEN. It's, I think it's not yet today, but it's a question just of uh, editing question. Uh, if I resume the 23 remarks, recommendations, I can resume them in eight different issues. The first one, it's fundamental to attract to the standardization work other stakeholders, and namely, namely the city. You cannot develop standard for city without direct involvement of city. It's not an easy task. ICLE is a member of the group, but they are one of the 34, 35 members of this group, so they should be reinforced and have a more important part of that. This condition the success of that work. Second, they have to develop a common framework uh, that is aligned with the uh, European Initiative for Partnership that was just mentioned before. And they have to develop also the framework based on a smart sustainable city model that was proposed 
and which uh, design was presented in the report end of 2014. And they also try to work on a basis of a core of worldly recognized concept definition to avoid being one more framework document. They have also to uh, prepare elaboration of standardization strategy and make recommendation to the Senelec board. They have to monitor the consistency of the standardization work of uh, on sustainable smart cities and community. And they have to prepare guidance to develop the use of this type of standards by the user, by cities, and by others. Another fundamental point is communication. Communication on the standard, especially to the local authority, is fundamental. There is a freight of many municipality that standardization is something that is an obstacle to their freedom. They don't want to have any, any imposed decision on the way they manage. They have been elected, they consider they are the only, the only uh, responsible from their policy. So uh, communication is fundamental to explain what really is standard. I uh, listen uh, at the beginning of this afternoon on what is standardization, and I fully agree on that. But many uh, municipal, local authorities don't know that. They don't have an idea, a correct idea, of what could be standardization system in this field of smart and sustainable cities and communities. So it's important to develop this. I just will focus now to report on three major points that uh, are in the report and in the recommendation. First, um, in uh, the report we recommend to use in Europe what has been developed as the six basis proposals for smart sustainable cities communities. Uh, they are exactly on the screen, city attractiveness, social cohesion, well-being, resilience, responsible use of resources, impact of, on the environment. We could discuss for months, years, have a lot of congress on this type of issue. At least we have six purposes that are now in this internal standard that should be uh, used in European standardization. And these six purposes have to be analyzed through 12 issues. And these 12 issues are defined in the ISO standard, should also be a basic element for developing the European standard. Another important point that was a decision of the TC268 ISO on smart sustainable city is a definition of smartness. There is an opposition between the electronic industry and the builder and construction, and each has its point of view on what is smart, what is sustainable. Do we have to oppose sustainable versus smart? So uh, with the agreement of some major electronic uh, company, we approved the definition that is on the screen of smartness, and I think this and that definition that has been also approved by the Sense and Elec Etsy coordination group should be one good working definition to go a bit further and to avoid opposing smart and sustainable. Well, to end this presentation, we also are facing a problem, and I have to thank the board of Sen because the group was considering that. Uh, there are so many initiatives that the uh, Sense and Elect Management Centers ask for coordination on this issue with ISO, IEC, ITU, and a letter was sent. Unfortunately, the results were not there, and there is still a problem to go further. But 
a step can be seen through an event that was organized jointly by AFNOR and Federation of Consulting and Engineering. It's another here I have on my uh, work. I work also for the Consulting Engineering Federation. And we had the 20th of May jointly with the Business Climate Summit in Paris, a side event where I had the pleasure to, to have the president of SEN attending it. Thank you very much. And uh, we discussed with some other major institutions like the uh, United Nations Environment Program, like UN, UN Habitat, like uh, ITU also was there on the way to go further. And UNEP has decided and launched this day what they call an ABC for Sustainable City. It's a glossary of 100 to 200 terms of existing definition in reference frameworks that are more or less recognized on the world that should be published for COP21. And uh, this document is an opportunity for clarification, for dialogue, and for future collaboration, not only between standardization organization, but also with the International United Nations Agency. I just remember that in June 2016 will be Habitat 3, a fundamental international meeting of the 200 states of the United Nations to define the agenda for the next 20 years on habitat and cities. And I think the standardization of their place being there, dialoguing with a dialogue with this international institution, with governmental institution, with non-governmental institution, and association of city. So thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, John, for, for covering that complex landscape, but also answering some of the questions that we posed at the beginning of the session. Some definitions and standards were beginning to develop uh, that are people-centric. Now, I'm going to turn to the technology end of the spectrum and invite uh, Simon Hicks to, to uh, speak to us now, to address us, chairman of the Etsy General Assembly, here launching into the, the telecoms end and the communications part. Simon, do come and uh, give us 10 minutes of wisdom. I'm not too sure about the wisdom, but I'll try. Yeah, um, I come from Etsy, the European Telecommunication Standards Institute. Um, we're an organization of, um, of um, industry members, so as you will appreciate, we work in a slightly different way from Sen and Senelec, but nevertheless, we are one of the uh, three European standards organizations. Um, our history is very much rooted in uh, producing standards for large communication systems. You only have to think of, of, the, of the mobile phone that you have in your pocket at the moment, or probably have in your pocket. Um, that was an Etsy standard. That, uh, this is a European standard success story on the global stage. Okay, we now cooperate with all the other regions of the world, but um, if there's one standards organization that um, is in the lead in that, um, I would suggest it, it is Etsy. Um, although we do work with our other compatriots through 3GPP, the third generation partnership project. Um, we still call it 3GPP, even though we're now on the fourth generation. I don't know whether at some point we might uh, call it 5GPP or something, I don't know, but uh, we still call it 3GPP for the moment, and that's, and that's, that's a brand that's known across the world. Um, so I'm, I'm going to look at some of the technologies that might support the smart city, in particular looking at uh, looking at them um, looking at them um, from looking at them um, from a 5G. Um, we don't actually have a, a smart cities activity as such in Etsy. Um, our focus is mainly on individual activities for products and services. These are many of the components that uh, you'll recognise in the smart city. The sort of things that we that, that, that we've heard from the other speakers that all need to come together. To, provi to provide the smart city. Um, here are some of the technologies that we have in Etsy that contribute to that. These are the names of the organizations uh, or our technical committees, and each one of them produces often hundreds of standards, so you'll be pleased to know I'm not going to list them all. 
Um, in particular, though, I would like to uh, focus initially on 1M2M. Um, this is our global machine-to-machine -machine initiative um, to provide uh, communications between machines. Um, this is a new area. Um, previously, devices, ICT, um, has focused mainly on communicating with itself or with, or with other similar devices. Um, in, in machine to machine, we address the needs of the machine. Um, obviously, it's, it's the ICT world coming together with machines. And um, I think it would be fair to say that this 1M to M comes out of a telecom stable. Um, and we're um, still looking, for some extent, for the connection with the, with the machine environment. But it's, it's a starting point. Um, again, like 3GPP, we're working with other standards organizations across the globe. So 1M2M is truly a global standards initiative. We have our compatriot organizations in all the major regions of the world working together with us on this. Um, so far, we have um, an initial standard that was released at the start of this year. This is, this is embryonic, but we're already beginning to see companies um, notably in Asia, I have to say, actually beginning to offer it and to take it up. Um, we're quite happy for other standards organizations to come in, in on this. Um, Send and sell it would, would, be, would be more than welcome, if you so wish. Now I'd like to turn to 5G. Um, at the moment, we're on 4G. So I'm kind of looking ahead here. So uh, a quotation from a well-known British statesman. Um, you'll probably notice from my accent that I am British. Um, so I'm going to try and look ahead here. Um, 5G is something probably coming in the early 2020s. Um, so uh, if I can provide an accurate description of it here, I will be very lucky. Um, but I'm going to try and signal where things might go. What will 5G do for us? What will it encompass? What about 4G? And what's the role for standards in all this? In mobile phones, and we work, as I always said, from 3GPP. Um, this is the organization that ETS is looking at in the main to um, for produce our new 5G standards, uh, where ETSI, ETSI works in 5GPP, in 3GPP already. Um, we hold the secretariat of 3GPP, so the secretariat is at our base in, um, from Sofia Antipolis in, um, from, in, um, from France, and um, all the partners uh, provide finance to support that secretariat and the organization of 3GPP. And each standards organization then issues the standards um, separately in their own continent or region at the same time. All the standards are the same, even though, even though they have a, have, a, have a number from that organization. Um, we started looking at 5G at our Future Mobile Summit in November 2013. Operators, industry, government and academics came together to see what it might look like. And the slides here are in the main drawn from that. This is a um, from European funded research project, METIS. Um, these are some of the ideas, some of the needs that we want from 5G. Um, if we're to move on a generation to 5G, it's got to offer something different from 4G. It's got to sort of look different and be different and feel different. Um, so it's probably going to be a bit more than a phone, a bit more than just a device you poke and play numbers on. Um, so these are some of the underlying technologies in 5G. I uh, won't go through the details. Um, some of you will recognize some words on there. Um, some, of the, some of you will see some words you probably don't know what, or what on earth they mean. Um, but in the main, 5G is about offering you a service, for whatever reason you're using it for, that works everywhere, every time. So rather than having to worry about changing your phone from Wi-Fi to 3G to 2G, or is there a signal in this building, or am I in Latvia, or am I in the UK, and who's going to pay for it, and what's the cost, and ooh, which is so difficult at the moment if you're trying to sort of uh, use your phone effectively. Um, 5G offers to take that away from you. Obviously, I'm sure there'll be a cost, but um, 5G aims to give you the service you need where you are when you want it. 
spectrum, radio spectrum. Um, Scott introduced me by talking about a different spectrum. Radio spectrum is a key component in this. Um, there's a small cartoon about radio spectrum. Those of, those of you who like them from uh, Dilbert might be amused by it. Some people don't. Is radio spectrum or more spectrum the only solution? We can't make spectrum. It's, it doesn't, it's, it's, it's like land. We only have a finite amount of it, or air. Um, so we have to use the spectrum we have uh, better than we currently do. We have to get more in, in it, more out of it. When we look at 5G, we, in the main, think of speed. So at the moment, we have a computer, for example, there on the left. Um, takes about one second to do something. But when we start using uh, radio devices to stop and start fast vehicles, to avoid collisions, we need the system, particularly the radio component part of it, to work very quickly. We can't wait while processors groan away and send data halfway around the world. Um, many of you will appreciate that. And you know, there, there will be many Sen and Senelec based devices in that chain. Um, so I'm looking here principally, of course, from, from, the IC, from, the, from the local ICT point of view at, at the radio interface. But we, we need to get down to these sort of times on the, on the right there when we're talking about 5G. And currently that's, that's beyond the technology of, of even 4G. Safety critical applications uh, a very likely need or part of 5G if it comes about. So what does the future hold? Um, these are some things that we can say with certainty. Um, there will be a fifth generation. Traffic will continue to increase. We can see that at the moment it increases year on year. The number of connected devices will increase. Um, there are various figures there. Some, some people say 10 times, some people say 100 times. I've even heard 1,000 times. Um, it depends which uh, report you read, but there will probably almost certainly be many more devices. There will be new different types of device. They will not just be phones, they will be things embedded in, device, in, embedded in other devices. There will be new priorities. At the moment, we don't have much what you would call critical infrastructure sat on um, sat on on 3 or 4g partly because of the of the sort of time delay issues i was referring to earlier but in future as we need to use the spectrum better as we need as these systems cost more and more we will need to op we will need to maximize the use of them so from both a commercial and a societal point of view we will need to be able to rely on one centralized infrastructure how we do that um how it happens is um in part um, a role for my other aspect in government um, from where I come from where, where I come from where I come from the administration so the commissions the administrations and standards bodies together will have to help define how this happens um, and we know of course that broadband is a great driver in the economy uh, wireless broadband radio broadband 5g broadband um, will be a key component part of that, as people now expect things to be wireless. Very few of us plug in our phones at home or plug in our computers anymore. You can do. Um, again, um, looking at some of the needs there, lower latency, longer battery life, so maybe that's something for, for the Senelec side of the world we're looking at. Um, how, can we, how can we get better batteries? Um, it's easily said. Um, I know it's very difficult to do. So these are, these are the sort of basic requirements that we're looking at, that we're trying to work for. Um, 5G will make it look as though you can get anything when you want it, when you need it. Um, so the networks will need to be more available, dependable and reliable, with better speed and throughput. And of course, they've got to be cheap, which um, I'm sure my commercial colleagues will sort out very quickly. So what's 3GPP doing? Um, basically, we're still in the very embryonic stages. Um, we have discussions around the service and the radio aspects, um, looking at what new technologies we might need, beginning to decide what standard streams we might need to initiate to bring 5G. Because, of course, um, we're still some years away from it. We're probably 
I have a diagram there which shows some of the key points. Um, I wouldn't read, try and read everything. I would in particular focus on the brown arrows, which are some of the ITU points as to when standards will be um, from picked up and we, we in sort of 3GPP and anybody else will need standards for 5G. Um, so really we're looking at 2020 as a sort of standards point. So probably early 2020s before we see equipment and systems realistically in the market. Um, so at this point in time, we're bringing together research ideas, um, lots of academics and um, firm companies are looking at the research side and we, need, we, we then need to go from that into the standards environment. So from a 3GP perspective, it's, it's still quite early and we're beginning to sort of see, see, see what the needs are and, and what committees we might need to, uh, to set up and work with. Okay, I think I'm almost there. Will 5G standards be done more differently? Yes, we're going to have to work a bit differently here um, in the sense that um, we're going to probably try and use something we call proof of concept, which is kind of making devices alongside the standards as we evolve them and also bringing open source solutions um, and actually, and actually uh, providing software as a standard rather than written bits of paper. So there we are, those are the conclusions and another Dilbert cartoon to finish with. There we are. Thank you. Thank you very much, Simon. So, so that's, uh, I'm reminded of uh, what Einstein was asked when someone said to him, what happens when you travel faster than the speed of light? And Einstein was quick to reply, you can't see where you're going. <laughs> There's some barriers out there. So Inetta has set the scene. Uh, Jean has decomposed the landscape. Uh, Simon has drilled into the area of telecoms, and now we're gonna put it back together again with Dan Palmer, uh, Head of Markets Development from BSI, my colleague from BSI, who will start to put it back together with the standards landscape, and then we'll conclude this afternoon with Tim O's back in Riga. So, over to you, Dan. Thank you. So what I want to talk about is, is how cities are working to become smarter, you know, the journey they go through and how using standards can help them accelerate that with reference to some of the work we've been doing in the UK. So, I mean, the situation in the UK is fairly similar to what we've already heard, you know, sort of a range of pressures on cities in terms of increasing population, ageing population, um, increased demand on services, um, reducing budgets to provide services, and the huge environmental pressures around climate change, resource scarcity, and the need to reduce energy and carbon use. And smart cities are seen as a potential solution to some of those problems by bringing together information and data um, and an analyzing it at a city level, being able to target services directly where they're needed, whether that's a question of installing smart lampposts so that you can um, dim the lights when there aren't people in the street, or whether it's about parking systems that pre-allocate parking spaces, or whether it's about, um, at a much um, higher level, being able to compare information from um, services that are managed differently, like healthcare services and social services, to understand what's really going on in a particular location and set your strategy. So there are a whole range of issues related to smart cities and we were asked by the UK government to develop a standard strategy for smart cities. And part of the reason they wanted us to do that was that it was taking too long, they felt, to get cities going and some good practice for replicable solutions would be something that could help them. Um, and also there's a lack of confidence in cities about procuring smart city solutions and a fear of vendor locking. So open standards were seen as a big benefit for cities to be able to um, procure something that they could change their supplier at some point in the future. Um, and when we looked at it, we identified the three different levels you could look at it for standardization. There's the technical side around interoperability and exchange of data. 
there's the process side around how cities um, actually go about delivering services with their delivery partners. And there's the strategic level um, about what they're trying to do in the first place. And it's that strategic level that's really where you need to start in smart cities. So the route map we've defined for sort of cities to follow in terms of getting to a start smart city is starting with the city's vision and strategy. And then you can start to look at you know, their capability to meet that strategy, what sort of gap analysis can be done, and what evidence there is, you know, the performance measurement of what they're doing in a minute. And out of that, you can develop the roadmap, and then you start to look at the enabling capabilities. So smart cities aren't really all about technology. The technology is a means to an end. But, but you've got to start from what's the purpose you're trying to achieve. Otherwise, you know, there's a significant risk of wasting a large amount of money. And service transformation and the enabling capabilities are the outcomes that you want to get to. And what we found in looking at some of the standards we've got in this space is that they can be put together in that sort of framework. So starting with the vision, there's a standard we have around community sustainable development. We've put that into ISO as one of the inputs into the ISO um, su sustainable city management system standard. Um, and this can be used to, as part of this sort of bottom-up approach to setting your strategy, bringing together the different stakeholders in the city, understanding what the needs truly are, and carrying out some sort of a maturity assessment of where you are at the moment and where you can move to in the future. So that is a standard that's been used in the UK. It's actually been used in Shanghai at the moment in a redevelopment of a district in Shanghai. And we hope that some of what's in that standard will then emerge in the ISO management system standard. But that talks about sustainability. There's also a question about actually what's the role of smart cities in helping achieve that vision. So we've developed an overview description of a smart city, because one of the things that came out very strongly was that city leaders often don't really get it at the moment. There are a small number of leading cities who are actually working very hard on smart cities, and a large number of follower cities that aren't implementing solutions or aren't quite sure what they should be doing. So this overview description of a smart city provides a means of looking at what difference a smart city could make. And again, it's, there's a maturity assessment approach. Um, the, the example on the slide is one that was done in Peterborough, which is a um, m small city in the middle of the UK. And you know, sort of, they can see that actually, on many of the key issues at the minute, they're lagging from where they want to be. And they've set some targets for how to get there and what they'd like to do at quite a high level. And those types of frameworks to assess where you are, they can be put together with some real evidence. And for real evidence, you need metrics. And that's the focus of much of the work in ISO. So there's the work around um, city indicators, which should provide, ultimately, a means for cities to compare their performance with other similar sized and, um, cities. And there's work also in ISO around infrastructure metrics, which ultimately could provide some sort of means of assessing the contribution investment in infrastructure could make to achieving those city goals. But having set the goals and the direction, you then need to start um, delivering projects. And that needs to start at the planning stage. I mean, the example I've given here is of, uh, from London Bridge Station, which is a major station redevelopment in the UK. And when the station was first put up, you know, sort of it was essentially a construction project. You know, sort of they put down the traps, put down the platforms, put up the concourse. I mean, I'm simplifying a little bit. But if you look at this, what they're doing now with the redevelopment, 
it, it's still a big construction project, but it's also a big energy project. They're looking at how to reuse some of the ground heat to provide station heat. It's an urban redevelopment project. They're looking at the impact of the station redevelopment on regeneration of the surrounding areas. And it's a much more complex and um, difficult project to deliver than it would have been when it was first created. So looking at that and other examples of complex projects which have an impact on the smart city in the UK. We've put together some guidelines for smart city planning which allow you to sort of think through how do you plan holistically? How do you rethink the services that are being used around a development? And how do you deliver these multi-party projects? And what do you need to think about for the future? You, know, sort of, you can't deliver it all at the moment necessarily, but say if you don't include the right ducting, you may never be able to upgrade your connectivity in the future. So there's a set of planning guidelines about the decisions that need to be taken before development starts. And then moving on to how projects are actually delivered, we've developed a smart city framework that sets out a sort of the key operational issues, you know, the guiding principles that cities could work to, some of the key cross-city governance and delivery processes, because one of the things that's very clear in smart cities is we're talking about um, changing the way cities work. It's often t talked about, you know, breaking down silos, it's, and sometimes people talk about breaking down the information silos, but they're also the organizational silos. If you want to upgrade all the lampposts in the city, for example, you've got to get budget from so many different people who all hold their individual budget. So how you bring that coalition of stakeholders together, how you manage this complex project, what the benefits realization strategy would like and what are the things you can't afford to get wrong. So that standard has been used in a number of UK cities like um, Birmingham, it's being piloted in the borough of Greenwich at the moment. I'm pleased to say it's also been used here in Reader. There's been an assessment of Reader against Pass 181 as part of the, um, their commitment to becoming a sustainable city. And then moving on to actually what you, how, practically how you use the data. Um, so this is really where you come into the question of the information silos. What we've developed as our first standard in this space is a data concept model. The illustration is of the um, city technology platform at, that's been built in Glasgow. We're, and some of the thinking behind that has contributed into this standard. Because the, what they've done there is taken 200 different data streams and brought them together in one platform with different outputs for different users. And that really requires some way of relating data from different sources without going back from first principles and recoding it all. So this upper level ontology that allows you to map a data set is one of the means by which you can bring different data sets together. I'll just say a little word about the international perspective, because uh, we've heard about the Sen Senlet Etsy um, work, which BSI is one of the standards bodies that's involved in that with the other members of Sen. We're also aware that there are initiatives in ISO, in IEC, in ISO, IEC, JTC1, in ITU, and they're all, all these standards bodies are creating their own smart city standard strategies. So one of the things that's crucial for the future is for these standards bodies to relate to each other and for, for the, there to be a coordinated approach between standards bodies so we don't end up with competing international smart city standards. We're working in, with partners in ISO in the ISO TMB advisory group to try and help bring that about. So if I just go back to sort of where I started on the overall roadmap for a city, 
What we've done so far in the UK has been very much about the city's capabilities. You know, we've really been looking at, is the city able to deliver smart projects? Because that's, that came out of the biggest barrier in the research and interviews that we did. Where we're looking to head next is really into some of the specifics around enabling capabilities and service transformation. So one of the, thing, one, one of the projects we've just kicked off is around what's the data sharing framework for a city. One of the big barriers at the moment in cities is they don't know what data they can share, they don't know how good it needs to be before they share it, and people who use the data don't know whether they can rely on it. And then there are all the commercial considerations regarding who owns the data. So setting out a framework by which people can make sensible decisions about what to do with data should be um, a help in that setting. We're also looking to develop some guidelines around business models because business models for smart cities is a very big barrier at the moment. It's, you know, a lot of the projects that have been developed have really been pilot projects that have either been centrally funded through government or they're demonstrator projects from large companies. And working out the sustainable business model and what types of business models suit, suit what types of project is still a challenge. And then there are the specific use cases, you know, the standards around lighting, parking, sensors, and the relationship with other related projects, areas of standards work like BIM and IoT. So there's plenty more to do. So to take that forward, we're now partnering with the Future Cities Catapult Centre in London. So that is the UK's um, innovation centre for smart cities. And working with them, we're bringing together a coalition of cities and companies to try and help us create quite quickly some early stage standards that then could be offered up to whichever international standards body is the most appropriate. So that's a quick run through of the work we've been doing in the UK. And I think it, it fits quite well with some of the other work that's going on internationally around interoperability and data, because a lot of that work is going to be international. And we're looking at the organizational issues in the UK. I think we've got something complementary to that that we can also offer. Thank you very much, Dan. So there's the City's Standards Institute coming together. Now our final speaker this afternoon is Timur Safulins, who is going to bring us back to Riga and uh, uh, to the energy space. So Timur, please, you've got a few minutes and then we'll take some questions. Great. Um, dear ladies and gentlemen, Riga guests, colleagues, uh, first of all I would like to thank organizers and all of you for this exciting event and opportunity to share expertise, ideas, and opinions. Speaking of smart cities, urbanization trends probably is the most related issue to be evaluated. Over the past 10 years, our planet has reached two significant results. First, the population number exceeded the level of 7 billion people. And secondly, for the first time in history, more than half of the world population lives in city. According to World Bank projections, by 2050, the urban population will double, which really means the urban population increases by 60 million every year. And urbanization has become so pervasive in several cities, such as Brussels, Riga, Seoul, and many others, that uh, one city might provide significant contribution of more than 30% share of a country's GDP. And that's the reason why it's necessary to demonstrate efforts focusing on urbanization trend and to identify the economical potential of urban areas, thereby giving them greater opportunities and freedom to achieve their potential. Uh, today, cities consume about 75% of the world's energy resources, creating about 80% of greenhouse gases thus calling for a new urban management models. As for now, we're standing at the point, then it's not enough for a city to provide standard 
transport, housing, energy service solutions. And future cities have a modern term of smart cities, which probably will be the driving force for cross-sector innovation and further growth. Smart city solutions don't belong to scientific fiction uh, anymore. As we have heard from our previous speakers, much of the technology is already available, providing conditions for the energy transport and healthcare sector, for example, development. Infrastructure, in this case, plays a vital role in urban development, regardless whether it's a business city or some kind of community. Uh, speaking about 2020 challenges, I do share the opinion that we're facing a new paradigm where the cooperation, not the competition, is a key challenge in the first place, uh, where cities should be evaluated from the new perspective, the grade of good, gooder, goodest city, not the good, better, best concept that is, was lasting for last years. Uh, for example, as it is already was mentioned today, there's a covenant of mayors as the mainstream European movement involving local and regional authorities, voluntary community to increase energy efficiency and use of renewable energy sources and territories. But their commitment, uh, covenant signatories aim to meet and exceed the European 20 uh, percent objectives by year 2020. And uh, I'm proud to say that Riga was one of the first capitals to sign Covenant of Mayors in 2008. Through cooperation with other cities in the implementation of a number of energy efficiency projects, Riga has been able to introduce new innovative technologies that add comfort and made citizens' lives more environmental friendly. <clears throat> As we speak of a complex approach, uh, one of the key points are smart districts. There are various districts with one single agenda to provide, a sustainable, complex infrastructure, and the complex should consist of a combination of building, transport infrastructure, uh, public spaces as well. Uh, and the concept is designed to help meet cities' overall strategy, not by only 2020, but for 2030 as well, uh, to create energy efficient, resident-friendly and modern neighborhood with reduced traffic flow in the city center, and uh, neighborhoods situated close to city center being used more intensively. Um, so what actually is the relationship between smart cities and innovation, business and socio-economical development, and why exactly we're talking about small-medium enterprises? Uh, smart solutions combined with infrastructure enable SMEs businesses get a strong foundation, which is a prerequisite for a sustainable development. Smart city stimulates innovation, which is a knowledge-intensive business basis. And speaking of business in the European Union, SMEs are the most important uh, market players at the moment because uh, for economical growth and employment, 99% uh, of European businesses are small and medium enterprises, as well as there's a significant fact that uh, since 2002 till 2010, 85% uh, of the new jobs were created uh, in European Union by small and medium enterprises. Uh, Typically, clusters, uh, as it's known, are formed around a particular industry by linking the companies with benefits from cost reduction factors and marketing costs in the context of research uh, and expansion to new export markets. In turn, the city acting as a cluster provides more opportunities by combining different sectors and thereby fostering the exchange of knowledge and technology as well as providing own infrastructure as a test platform for innovative solutions. So regarding the cities, it's important to create conditions for dynamical development, providing information and competitive analysis of the local market. Uh, on this basis, cooperation with 
existing industry association will play an important role in development of sustainable strategies for enhancement of business environment as well as for complex city infrastructure because local authorities are interested in promoting and stimulating small medium sized enterprises not only uh, because of economy growth and job creation but also in context of uh, innovation and improvement of urban infrastructure for citizens for uh, greener living. So, uh, the conclusions are, uh, as there is no clear definition for smart cities, as well as transport method of determining so-called lighthouse projects, it's necessary to adjust standards in order to provide complete strategically clear understanding and thus more robust smart city initiative development as well as further dissemination of innovative solutions. Secondly, unified standards for city as a business classes could foster cooperation between cities and small medium enterprises, bringing additional value, developing sustainable strategies for enhancement of business environment. And the last but not the least is smart city networking that might be used as a tool to set new investment priorities and accelerate business innovations with social extra value uh, for not just a single city development bar for a regional cohesion entirely. So that's all for me. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>
having new s solutions um, brought in, you know, sort of being able to think broader than just um, we need to approve these buildings and they're just buildings. You know? So I, th I think a lot of what we've worked on so far has been to try a sort of decision-making framework to help the city understand what the possibilities are. And when I talk about the city, mm. it's not actually just public sector, it's public and private sector yeah. and the full range of delivery partners. Yeah. So I think there is a balance. You know, sort of it's always one of these questions. You start top down or bottom up in a city, and actually sort of it's a bit of both. The, I, mean, I could add to that because I sat on the ministerial forum, but the Minister for Cities created a forum uh, 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 not to define a strategy, but just simply to bring the actors together. So the academics, the innovators, the industry, the standards body, the cities themselves, all in a room, the chief scientist, and to discuss their strategy and what good practice looked like. And the model there was to accelerate the idea, accelerate progress by giving confidence to the industry, suppliers, and the cities that they could go ahead and develop their best practices. So it was an acceleration process. It was not a not a strategic, uh, a top-down directional process. It was simply a facilitation to bring the community together around the uh, programme of standards. And it, it seems to work well. Yes, Anita. I wanted to add a little bit uh, on replicability and transferability of different solutions, which are obviously one of the key issues for being a smart city. And what we learn from this Green IT Network project that it is necessary um, that not only guidance but facilitation of exchanges between cities happen and that it happens both at political and at experts level mm -hmm. and if there is that kind of interest and will uh, then the large projects costing 40 million euros a year uh, are, tra are being transferred and, and, and that is a key issue that we, we see a lot of pilots, but we do not see real mechanism how to encourage these new so solutions, business, city, universities to be employed at, at elsewhere mm. in Europe or outside. Mm. Great, so models to encourage. I mean, bear in mind this, this concept is about people, not technology. Bear in mind that cities are governed and there's public money at stake. So once you have public money and citizens involved, then there's a very serious obligation on the city authorities and, and indeed government to take an interest in, in the direction uh, of decision making. Big part of it, Simon. Just um, wearing my hat as working for the, for the administration rather than as the Etsy chairman in particular, um, the big driver here has to be that they do it at the at the cost that's already there. Um, anything anything that costs that costs more is very difficult, if not impossible, to implement in the in the current um, climate. So really, it's got to be about using the same the same money that's already there to achieve more, and ideally at 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 a lower cost. In which case, that will that will make it even 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 more attractive. But of course, how do we demonstrate that? How do we promote it? How do we actually make that a reality? Um, what can we point at? Mm. How can you get long-term investment uh, commitments? Uh, anyone else from the floor? Yes, Nenad. I'm Nenad Nikolic from Croatia. I'm asking Mr. Simon Hicks. You have uh, uh, told us about uh, uh, 5G generation uh, plan for 2020 but and and uh, but i think that it's uh, some intermediate generation four and a half g based on <laughs> lte advanced uh, network which is uh, better for from the aspect of electromagnetic pollution and uh, they avoiding uh, obstacles which exist in the city my question is uh, easy. Uh, uh, does uh, uh, where in the world we have established LTE, LTE advanced network at this moment, and what's the experience with that uh, moment for big cities? Thank you, Nayad. So four and a half G, Simon. Where is it happening? Well, um, from 
um, from LT Advanced as being rolled out particular in the in um, from in um, for, in um, from North America at the moment. Um, we're seeing it uh, it um, in Europe as as well, but um, but I'm not quite as as um, as fast. Um, the initial experience, of course, is mainly one of making what we see at, what we see before at the moment um, a bit faster than it was before. So we're still really in the very early days as to where as to where it might go in comparing 4G and um, from and um, and um, from 3G. Um, one of the theories for 5G, of course, is that it might just look like a very good version of the of the current 4G that we that we have at the moment, and th and that may well be enough to actually um from satisfy the demands that people um from want to want to want to a uh, place on the on the mobile environment. It it may be all or all it actually needs. We might not need lots of revolutionary technologies or um, for anything within that. Um, so 5G is a mixture of both evolution and um, from and um, from and um, from revolution. Um, my personal suspicion is that it'll is, is that it'll be quite a lot of evolution. Um, probably not too much. Probably not too much um, from uh, revolution. But y yes, we will see those technologies emerging on from 3G towards 4G and um, in support of the smart cities and other concepts around that. Um, it, will be an, it will be an evolutionary thing. We do not suddenly wake up one morning and find we have a smart city. Um, it's getting smarter with different things all the time and that's, that's really where these concepts need to have to come down to specific products, specific services, joining, joining specific things up together. Um, the, and that happens over a period of time as we join that to that and then we join that to it. Um, we don't suddenly go mm. from 3G to 5G or from smart or from, mm. a, or from an unsmart city to a smart city. Mm. I liked your uh, comment about being the glue and uh, of course there's a race against time as other products evolve like driverless vehicles and uh, autonomous vehicles as they are piloted on the roads in Europe. And then there's all kinds of dimensions around the speed at which the communications can happen and reliability of the communications and of the software that are driving the ethical decisions in that vehicle. Uh, uh, so your car is already a computer on wheels. Uh, and and can, can 5G happen fast enough uh, uh, to enable this? Yeah, um, you probably wouldn't want to put a driverless car on a 3G system. <laughs> you might just want to do it on a 4G system. But even then, you'd have to be careful how you how yeah. you how you roll the system out, yeah. um, and you wouldn't want to sort of um, a break in an area of no mobile coverage, for example. No, absolutely. Could be awkward. Not indeed. And you may not even be able to charge it. Now, anyone else? Any more questions on smart cities and standards? How we're going to unlock the potential of uh, smart cities for the citizens of Europe? There's a question here in the middle. Thank you. My name is Pascal Poupet from Afnor, France. Uh, the speakers made very clear the expectation for flexibility and adaptability uh, in each city uh, according to its particular challenges and also the need for clear uh, and robust concepts. At the same time, we observe, you made very clear the extraordinary proliferation of uh, production of concepts each of them is supposed to be very robust and very uh, unique and central. Uh, I, I imagine how in ISO we might uh, coordinate uh, and manage the situation. I can imagine how we could do it with IEC and ITU. But then I saw that uh, the UN organizations are also coming up, and there are many of them. How do you see uh, us managing uh, the identification of a core set of clear and robust concepts that everybody could refer to without uh, doing too much of literature, literature review every time. Thank you. Mm. So where are we going to go? That's one for you, Jean, I think. I was just uh, commenting that uh, United Nations Environment Programme, UNEP, is absolutely aware of that problem and they are facing a difficult situation for that. So they decided to publish for COP21 this uh, ABC for Sustainable City. 
They don't want to impose a view and to impose 10 or 8 concepts. They have a liberal approach of that. They say we will make a repertory of existing definition. This will be a catalyst for ongoing works, for dialogue, and it will be a catalyst for meeting and discussion. How? This is not, I have no idea on that. This is a question for the management of uh, Senelec and Etsy. But uh, at least I think it's a work of uh, European standardization on smart sustainable city, community, district, and, and all of these things should be uh, placed in the perspective of these ongoing international works. You remember that in September, the United Nations will adopt for the first time in its 10 objectives sustainable development. They should adopt it. And they will replace Millennium objectives. Second, COP21, there will be one day that will be dedicated to cities. And let's hope they will find some agreement on that. And then you have the agenda for the next 20 years that will be decided by all the states that will meet in Quito in June 2016. And then COP22 in Marrakech. So there are opportunity for uh, joint works between of them. But the question was how the, I leave the managers of Sands and Alec and Rosa to mm. give proposal. I'm not able to do that. But the, 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 the ambition of coordination is so important. And of course, if you think back to those comments earlier this afternoon about the role of voluntary standards, the partnership of voluntary standards, uh, supporting regulation where appropriate, but otherwise unlocking the market potential, unlocking the performance of cities. In this world of smart cities, you see the convergence of everything from 5G and telecoms to, to the involvement of citizens uh, and everything in between, the connection to the building information modeling world, the connection to the Internet of Things, all of that coming together. So what I want to encourage us to think about is to demonstrate through cities that this is a reality. And I'm going to come back to Anita to explain how she's going to do it in Riga. Well, I have very short, a very short comment. I think there, there shouldn't be any process about cities without cities and different groups of inhabitants. Absolutely. And there are mechanisms at UN level, there are mechanisms at EU level, we can secure that. There should be just uh, the right process in place. There is a question also. Question. Okay. Yes, Thank you very much, uh, Francisco Verdera, Senan Senelec Management Center. Uh, talking about unveiling the potential for the smart cities, I think uh, in the presentation of Jan Felix, I saw uh, breaking silos, vertical silos. Uh, which is the opinion of the, of the panelists about how to unveil also the potential of non-ICT industries, which can benefit from the initiative of, of uh, smart cities standardization? Hmm. I don't know if the question is clear enough. Yeah. Thank you. So other industries that are gonna unlock their potential through this technology? Simon. I think it's, uh, it's a very difficult issue. Um, I think it requires standard organizations and different silos to actually have some element of them from of them from of them from trust towards each other. But realizing that if we're all to go together uh, forward into the future, um, each set of standards has to provide enough little hooks. Um, they don't need to throw away everything they've ever written in the past, but they do need to provide hooks so that other standards can be linked onto them easily so that we can get this co connectivity between A and B and C and D. Um, and I would suggest that if we don't do that, um, those organizations, those standards, those products will eventually no longer be here. I think, um, yeah, okay. I mean, I think Paco was talking a bit more about the industries themselves. Yeah, yeah. So, so enabling, rather than just take our standards hat off and think about the industries in the cities. So which industries in your city in Riga are going to benefit from this? Ah, Tim. Oh, regarding the question, uh, I think there's a big role for the city 
as a connector between uh, industries. Yes. Because, for example, creating an ICT platform, uh, there is an opportunity to connect, for example, transport and, um, and social services. Yes. So uh, link it through the city and with the support of the city as a test platform, it will unlock the potential of every industry in the city. For example, in Riga, we're now trying to connect ICT with transport and energy within yeah. lighthouse projects. Uh, yeah. We have an e-catalog with 16 projects uh, yeah. available online. So. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, and I, I think uh, I think to the work that's been done on Industry 4.0, you'll see the distribution of manufacturing plant and small-scale manufacturing. I think in the health sector in particular, where you're connecting a citizen through primary health, mental, social, and physical health care, and that whole health infrastructure, which is very expensive in, in our economies, and that will benefit enormously from the Internet of Things and smart cities. So a lot of opportunities. Jean? Just a comment. Uh, COP21 is an objective of uh, all uh, parties involved, all states of the United Nations, and they have the difficult task to achieve an agreement, a potential agreement in December. They have been working for years and years, especially last year. Why don't imagine that the standardization body would work together on the leader of city because without city it's stupid, <laughs> we can do that. They would organize something with the objective is preparing during the months before some common objective, what you need, what you really need, having in line that you want third independence of city, you don't want something being imposed. I fully understand that, but the standard can be a sort of uh, element. So having some clear objective that within six months, seven months, for why not for UN uh, Habitat 3 in Quito, why not having at this moment the uh, decision, these, we agreed on that and that and that. Brilliant, Jean. So, Anita, will you lead us into the future? <laughs> will you, the city of Riga, lead us to Kyoto next year? Well, certainly we are in a network of very powerful, smart, and small and large cities. And I think that with those 6,000 mayors in Europe signing, we are the European leaders, and we are leaders in the world, so there is a will in cities. Fantastic. Well, I can't, I can't ask for another question after that, Anita. Thank you so much for that. Thank you all for being here this afternoon and, and enjoying a most interesting uh, uh, discussion. But thank you particularly, may I ask us all to thank our speakers, Anita Elite, Jean-Felix, Simon Hicks, Dan Palmer, and Timur Safalins. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you all for coming.